Hi, ladies. Hi, how are you feeling after lunch? Good, awesome. So I'm very, very excited to be talking about our next panel. Um, this panel came really after many requests from attendees who were like, hey, you always talk about things for young people, and we travel differently in our various stages of life. So this panel is called Travel at Any Age. And I thought that I would bring three lovely ladies that I know very well and who I all admire and respect up to join me. So please give a warm round of applause for Sherry Ott, Carolyn Ray, and Timothy Workman. All right, let's do this. So let's dive into a little bit about, you know, what we're talking about today. And I'll just start off by having you introduce yourself to the audience. Okay. I'm Sherry. Um, let's see. I didn't have a passport until I was 30 years old. Uh, and that kind of kicked off a whole bunch of travel for me. But what I do now is I'm a blogger at otsworld.com. Uh, I've been doing that since 2006 when I started off on a year-long career break when I was 36 years old. I am now 52. Um, so, so I've been, and basically since 2006, I've been traveling pretty much full time, uh, except for the last two years, which was a big shock in my life. But um, that's where you can find me, and that's what I do. Hi everyone, I'm Carolyn Ray, and uh, today I am the uh, publisher and CEO of Journey Woman, which was the first uh, solo women's travel website in the world formed in 1994 by Evelyn Hannon. If you've been around solo travel for a while, you might know her. Uh, she was somewhat iconic. Um, I started my career the first 30 years as a CEO and an executive working in marketing and branding, uh, helping big businesses grow. And with the acquisition of Journey Woman three years ago, uh, at the request of Evelyn and her family, I am now trying to help small businesses grow. So not only is, um, is Journey Woman, uh, to me, a, a platform for solo travel, but it's also a way to help women-owned small businesses grow their businesses. And just one other thing I'll say is when I turned 50, which was, I think, three years ago, um, I hit a major milestone and decided that I wanted to travel the world full-time. This is what I wanted to do. I quit my job. I sold everything I owned. I had a three-bedroom house, a car, everything, and said goodbye to it. And then Journey Woman came along. So you never know what's going to happen in your life when you make a decision and you put it out into the universe, which is what I did. Didn't expect Journey Woman. Didn't expect I would be sitting here today. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> and didn't expect I would be doing travel writing, which was really what my dream was. And it just all came together in this crazy, crazy way when I was uh, 51. So it's really great to be on this panel with you guys because you're so awesome and I've been learning so much from you already and I'm really happy to be part of this event here with all of you. My name's Timothea. I am a retired teacher as of a few, I guess like six months ago. I taught high school for 37 years. One of the reasons I chose being a high school teacher, besides the fact that I love teenagers and wanted to go back and rescue them and pull them from the edge and give them some kind of um, a sense of enthusiasm for who they were was because I had all these breaks that I could travel during. <laughs> and um, that was super fun. So I spent a lot of my vacations figuring out where I was going to go next. I've worked as a road manager for a rock band because I could travel on the road. I've um, been able to visit a lot of places in the world. And since I retired, I just bought a little van, Mercedes Sprinter van, and have turned it into a camper. And so I plan to spend this next part of my life traveling around North America, uh, still traveling around the rest of the world. I'm going to get into some travel writing myself and um, doing just kind of figuring out what the next thing is. I love that. I think it's, and her van is so cool. <laughs> I actually have a question for everyone out here. <laughs> while we're getting started on this topic. Who out here feels that when you travel, you feel younger? Yeah. Yeah. 
That's, I, for me, that's one of the most important things about travel. And yeah, it's like the fountain of youth, if you ask me. But I was just curious. I wonder if it's might. because it brings you joy, right? It makes you feel more joyful. And because you play when you're traveling. You're exploring, yeah. you're trying new things. I also read something that was um, really interesting about aging is that you know how when you're young, it seems like every single year lasts forever. And then as you get older, every year goes by like that. The reason that that happens is when you're young, you're learning new things. And when you learn new things, it takes more of your energy and it expands. And what you're doing is you're creating more memories. When you get older, if you're doing the same thing every single day, you're not learning anything from that activity that you do, so you don't create more memories, so there's not as much stuff there to fill up and take with you at the end of each day. So I think one of the things about travel that's so great is it forces you to have to get out of your comfort zone, to have to then expand your comfort zone, and to learn more things, so it slows time down. So if you want to live a longer life and have longer years, travel. <laughs> I love that. Um, so how do you think that your travel style and your travels have evolved over, you know, the span of your life thus far? I think for me, um, you know, I traveled a lot um, when I worked for different businesses. I would add on more time and, and I got really good at like maximizing my two or three weeks a year of holiday and I would go to really amazing places. So it was still... It, it was like a part of my life, but it wasn't the main part of my life. And as I said, when I hit 50, I real I was like, this like this is it. Like I have all this. And by the way, I went on a trip to Kenya, and I came back from that, and that's why I sold everything. So I I had gone through this kind of a shocking moment where I came home from the trip. I looked at my house, and I went, I do not need all this stuff. Like it can go. And I want to live the life that I've been dreaming of, which is to travel. And I had no idea then how I would make that into a business or, or anything else. But I left my house with a backpack and a couple boxes. And I auctioned off, you know, 17 years, 20 years of whatever I, junk I had accumulated in my basement, which most of which was not mine. <laughs> and um, so for me, it's like life and travel are now the same thing. And... All the lessons I have learned in my life, I have learned through travel, I think, like trusting your intuition and giving it up to the universe and putting, those are all things you learn when you're traveling, as far as I'm concerned. And then you look at your life and you go, well, that, that's what I did in this situation and that's what I did in that situation. And even when I bought Journey Woman, I bought it because the, the silliest possible reason, which was, was there was a photo of Evelyn uh, with her arms up at the, um, the, the end of the world sign in Ushuaia, up with her arms like this, and her daughter showed it to me on her Facebook page, and I had the same picture on my Facebook page at the same time. And I went, well, this is kind of weird, you know. But it was, it was one of those moments when things click into place in a way that you don't understand, but you just have to go with it and follow your intuition, and so that's what I did. So I think when I, when I think about this question, how has travel changed, I look back at my life and because I had all these summers that I could do something, I always wanted to plan something cool. And I also always wanted to plan something for myself at various milestones, like you say when you turn 50. So when I turned 40, I wanted to be in the Sahara Desert riding a camel underneath the starry sky and watching the sun rise on my birthday when I turned 40. So. I figured out how to do that, and I did that one. And then I thought, well, okay, what the heck am I gonna do when I turn 50, because that was so cool. And I thought, well, what is the opposite of a desert? A hot desert. Well, it's a frozen desert. So I planned a trip to go to Antarctica and go to South Georgia and see all the wildlife there. And that was just, that blew my mind. My mind is still blown from that trip. If you ever, ever get a chance to go down there, you have to go because it's like looking at the air conditioning system of the entire planet. Um, and the color is so different from anything that I've ever seen down there. And that was cool. And then I thought, well, okay, when I turn 60, what am I going to do? And I thought, well, when I was a little girl, I loved to make dollhouses. And so I would build dollhouses. And I, I love the whole tiny house movement and it's because it's just so fun, you know, putting all these things together. And that's when I thought, okay, I'm going to design this van and then I'm going to have it um, 
when I turned 60. It was a couple months after I turned 60 when I picked it up. But I, I had those milestones for myself. And I was thinking, how has my travel changed? I think it's the who, what, where, when, why, and how. How? Because I've had a career and I've saved up my money, I can travel a little bit nicer than I did when I was younger and I didn't have any money and I was sleeping at train stations with my backpack on. Um, I don't have to do that anymore. So that is a really lovely thing. Um, who I'm traveling with, well, it could have been friends, it could have been by myself. Then when I had a, a son, I was taking trips with him, and I planned it all thematically around what he would like. So we would do a Harry Potter tour to England. I probably wouldn't have done that if I were by myself, but it was fantastic. And then when he got older, I found out you can rent castles in the UK and um, through Landmark Trust, where they take old buildings and they fix them up enough so that even though the ruins are all over the place and it looks romantic and magical, you've got plumbing and electricity and not so many drafts coming in. And <laughs> how cool is it to take a kid in middle school with his friend to go rent a castle that if you split it with somebody else, um, who also has some kids, is about the cost of a Best Western per night. And plus you have your own kitchen and everything. And they were quoting Shakespeare and having sword throwing contests and everything. Um, so it, it, that I'm not probably going to do now in my life. But I think that when you think about where you are in your life, you're always going to be able to find really cool things that fit with who you are and who you have in your life and um, what, what can be magical for you. Yeah, I, uh, it's all kind of, I, I love the idea of quoting Shakespeare and having sword fights. I think I might want to do that now. Um, <laughs> That's his curse of having an English teacher for a mom. So. <laughs> uh, my travels have definitely changed through the years. I would say I've always had a very unconventional life, um, and my travels have also been rather unconventional. Uh, it started out very normal in my 20s, you know, college, you finally start getting some money, you start accumulating everything, and you start doing your first trips. And, you know, that was really cool. And as I said, I was 30 when I got my first passport, and I started, I went to Turkey for the first time, which was a really odd thing to do when you had your first trip overseas. Um, and I realized that I really, I was very interested in other cultures and going international. So then I started doing more international travel. And then I threw everything out the door at 36 years old, and I decided to quit my corporate career just for one year. This was before, so this was 2006, this was before the idea of like, oh, digital nomad or blog, we didn't even call it that. I just needed a break because I had been working for 14 years on my career and accumulating things, and I just, I always say my, that first career chose me, I didn't choose it. And, and that was great. I went with it. It was very successful. But I needed a break because I needed to decide, did I want to do that for the rest of my life? Being, I was in IT. Uh, uh, and I didn't know if I did. So I quit that job and I said I was going to travel around the world for one year. And that's when I started my little website. So my mom knew that I was okay, basically, and a place to put my photos. And <laughs> I was able to get in touch with what I liked with travel. And I found, surprisingly, that I really loved to travel to developing countries. And so I ended up in that year stretching it out to about 16 months before I came back um, because I stayed in cheaper countries for travel. And then I, I also knew within three months of that trip that I never wanted to go back to IT. Uh, then I just had to figure out what in the world was I going to do, because once again, blogging wasn't an option at that point in 2007. Uh, I taught ESL in Vietnam, um, and I decided that I really wanted to live abroad. So most of that first kind of career break year, I'll call it, was hitting all the bucket list stuff. I went to Paris. I did all the things I wanted to, you know, everything, all the, all the high, what do I want to say, where everyone wants to go. Um, and then the next 10 years, I actually was completely nomadic. Uh, once again, also kind of before we called ourselves digital nomads. Uh, the blog kind of took off, the world changed, social media came out, I was curious, got into it. But I did all of that so that I could keep traveling. And so all of my travels then became this, 
it was complex thing of like, you know, I go here for a few months and then I'm here for a few months and then I'm here. And I would be years without going back to the United States. Um, and I started getting really involved in journeys, like epic journeys. I did the Mongol rally, driving a car from London to Mongolia over the course of six weeks. I did the rickshaw run, which was a race through India where you drove an auto rickshaw like 2,000 miles <laughs> across the country of India. I did the Camino de Santiago. I did St. Olaf's Way. Like I started doing all these journeys because they really spoke to me. Um, and then after about 10 years of being nomadic, I decided to get a home. And now my travels are kind of like the spoke of a wheel, right? So I'm going in and out and in and out. Um, I'd say they're still very focused on uh, big journeys, epic things. In fact, now I love to go the more remote, the better. The more off the beaten path, the better. That's what fuels me. But I think throughout this whole progression, I, you know, I did all kind of the normal stuff at first. And then you just really have to follow your heart. You try things and you figure out, this speaks to me. Developing countries spoke to me. And then I hit a time where it was journeys. And now, you know, I'm doing bigger epic trips, I would call them. So you just have to, you know, try things, see what speaks to you, and go with it. Yeah, absolutely. And I love your different stories because, like, it's, it's really interesting to see that you went from being really nomadic, doing the slow mad thing, to being more stationary. And then the two of you were like, no, I'm going to be more nomadic now. So, I mean, I guess ultimately the, the answer is there's no right or wrong way to live your life, right? But I do think that sometimes as women, we fall into like the rules, like we feel like we can't do things because it goes against the grain. So I'd love to hear your perspectives on that. I'll, mine's a <laughs> really quick answer because I was, never, I was never good at following rules. I was always the rule breaker. I never got married. I never wanted kids. So I never really felt a big pressure um, to follow the rules, I guess. So I never really struggled with that as much. Social norms are very hard sometimes, and I just have to kind of remind myself that, like, I'm unique. I don't have to follow these rules, no matter how much social pressure I think is out there. But I'll let you guys... Yeah, I was a really good girl till <laughs> I was about uh, 31 and became divorced with a little girl. And once you've done that, when you've been brought up in a very traditional home where divorce is not... Um, supported, I would say. Uh, you, for me, I became less fearful. Like, I thought, if I could raise this little girl, and she's now 21, and she's yeah. fabulous, and she's a wonderful traveler, <laughs> if I could raise this little girl on my own, there's nothing more scary than that for me. So I became a rule bender, a rule breaker, and I respect rules, but I also think they need to be bent or broken. And, um, and that's how I've, you know, even with Journey Woman, you know, coming into a travel website uh, at the beginning of a pandemic and relaunching it, um, you know, I don't know, April 2020 was when I relaunched everything. And after spending months, <laughs> you know, redoing a 25-year-old website and all of that, you, you are told, oh, there's certain ways you make money in travel. And I'm so glad to hear the discussions this morning and everything because what I've discovered is I can do anything I want. And I can, uh, I can be anything I want. And so the way that the rules applied to, even to me as a travel writer and as a travel business, I just, I paid no attention to them. I really don't look at what other people are doing. I'm just like, okay, what do, what do people need? Mm -hmm. And so we're doing courses, we do webinars, we do book clubs, we do, we have a store, we're going to sell your journal, <laughs> and, uh, and, all, and a, a women's directory that supports other businesses. I mean, this is not a travel website. This is m much, much more than that. But because I've ignored the rules generally, uh, I feel I can do whatever I want, and it's my freaking business, so I will. <laughs> so, so there. Amen, and sister. <laughs> Oh, well, my answer is kind of simple, too. I don't know what the rules are. I'm so out of it that I, I don't know when I'm doing something that's that. not considered to be what we should be doing or not doing. Exactly. Um, so I just think we should be having fun. Yeah. This is life. We each get one. We get to do whatever we want to with it. If somebody tells us we shouldn't be doing something, well, they don't have to do it, but we can. 
they can do what they want to with their own lives. And I just think it's so important for us each to claim our own life and not have this constriction on it. And I actually have a question I want to ask you. Do you guys know the idea of, do you see the glass as half empty or half full? So the way you answer that is going to say a lot to do with whether you feel like life is good or life is bad. And I would encourage you to ask yourself, if that glass is life, do you think that the water is slowly draining out of it and then you get old and then there's nothing left? Or do you think of it <laughs> Pressing as, me already. <laughs> which I hope nobody does. Or do you think of it as a glass that's in the process of continually being full and being filled up until it's overflowing constantly? And if you think of aging that way, you're going to say, I've got this day in front of me where amazing, wonderful things can happen. And you can be expectant of good. And just like somebody was saying earlier about the red car image, you know, once somebody says on the road, you know, do you see all those red cars? And then the next day you start noticing it. If you expect your life to have good in it at whatever age, at whatever experience you're in, with however how many numbers you have in the bank, but you expect good, amazing, wonderful things to come into your life, then you're going to start seeing them and being able to take opportunities. Just like even being able to come to this conference, who knew that this festival was going on until you discovered it? And then you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I found this. And that's another thing of good coming into your life. So I think it's really important when you're thinking of age to think about what your perspective is about the experiences that come into your life and not to limit things ever. I'm going to say my life is a champagne fountain just bubbling constantly. <laughs> that's, that's my new vision now. That's I like great. that. It's just constantly filling yeah, what and you bubbling fill in that and it's bottle champagne. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and like life is a journey, right? So like there's always going to be people, I think, at any stage of life, wherever you're at, who have their own opinions on how you should be living it. And, you know, when I was in my 20s, I was really voraciously traveling. Like, I wanted to go everywhere. I didn't care if I had to scrub toilets for it. I would sleep on the floor. I would, you know, I would bartend just to buy a pizza. Like, I was fully willing to do that. And people would be like, mostly my family, would be like, that's super dangerous. This is not a smart decision, you know? But I was having such fun experiences. And now in my 30s, it's like, I've seen all seven continents somehow, and I never set out to make that a goal, but it just happened because I was going and going and going. And now I feel like I'm pressed against the clock to have family, right? So now I'm 35, so now I'm like, oh gosh, I have to slow down, because I'm running out of time. So there's like different levels of feeling like you don't have enough time to do all the things, right? I mean... <laughs> well, you, do, you do each thing at the time when it's the right time to do it. So I didn't have my son until I was 42, which I wouldn't necessarily suggest people do, um, <laughs> but, um, but it worked out that way. And um, I've, you, you'll fit it in. You fit it in. You don't realize there's so much more that you can fit into your life when you're getting there. I had talking about not understanding the rules. When I did get pregnant, my husband said, oh my gosh, we'd been together for 17 years and suddenly thought, well, should we have kids? Oh yeah, okay, let's see what happens. And bam, there we have one. Um, and he said, is there anything in your life that you're gonna regret not having done before you become a mom? And I did have that uh, idea that, oh, once I become a mom, everything in my life is gonna shut down, which is the mm -hmm. most ridiculous mm -hmm. lie ever. It just expands in so many ways. And I'm talking about travel. But the, the answer that I had for him is, yes, I'm really going to regret not going up to Kodiak Island and watch the grizzly bears catch salmon. <laughs> so he said, okay, you should go. And I went when I was six months pregnant and went hiking up there, watched the grizzly bears eating the salmon, and had some amazing experiences actually myself with running into a mama grizzly bear who had a spring cub late in the summer, which was not usual, and it still had the white collar on it. Um, I actually was kayaking at around 11 o'clock at night because it's still bright and beautiful there and turned around the corner and as close to, even closer than I am to Kelly right now, was this beautiful big mama grizzly bear with, um, I could see the pores in her nose. Um. You know, who knew that bears had pores in their nose? Um, and her little baby right there. And, and we were fine. To me, it was beautiful and magical and I had no reason to be scared because I just knew everything was going to be okay. And I, I saw her two more times on that trip 
and they told me afterwards that nobody ever saw her again. But what I felt like it was just the way the universe gives you this beautiful gift of saying, mm. it's gonna be okay, you can be a mom later in life. You're still gonna have beautiful, wonderful things when you turn the corner. So you never know what's gonna mm. be out there. And um, I think travel gives you these gifts that help you understand your own life and be grateful for the things that are in it. Yeah, and sometimes you have to just have these conversations where I'm like, what am I thinking? I still have so much time. I can do whatever I want. I can go anywhere I want. It's going to be fine. <laughs> well, think about how much you did already in your life at this point. Yeah. You know, my gosh, if you do that much again, even in 10 more years, it just, it's... Yeah, I think that sometimes I think, like, if it all ends tomorrow, it's been a wild ride. It's been a, gr it's been a great time. So, <laughs> and I think that's how I always wanted to look at my life, you know? Um, but let's, let's get for real for real because we're in a room full of women. <laughs> Listen, I want to ask something. What's menopause like? <laughs> it sucks, but <laughs> it really sucks. No. Um, it's just another stage in our lives that we've been given. Um, I will say for me... It's one of the reasons, probably, just getting a little bit older, menopause, all the lovely stuff that comes with it, uh, is one of the reasons why I decided to get a home base again. Um, being on the road, and I was traveling on my, by myself when I was nomadic, but being on the road and being on the road for that long, over a decade, it can be, it, it's wonderful, but it can also be really isolating, super isolating. Um, you meet friends all the time, fast friendships. You were talking about them yesterday. I have friends all over the world. But the longer I was on the road, the less I felt like anyone really knew me. Even though I had a blog and all these followers, and I'm, you know, it was very weird. But so as I was getting older, I was finding that things like insurance and a regular doctor is really important, <laughs> at least for me. Um, and especially as I was starting to go through all the menopause stuff, it was, it was very important. So that's one of the reasons why I decided to get a home base again. Now, when I got that home base, I, it's very tiny. It's a little 500 square foot studio apartment. I'm not there that often, but I do have um, a regular doctor and all of that stuff. For me, the emotional part of menopause was was and is still my biggest challenge. And that's hard when you're out on the road. So you've got to figure out ways to stay really plugged in with friends, whether that's digitally or you know however. But I do think just like any big change in life, it's so important to have you know, your people that you can talk to. Um, so that's been some of my experience. The other thing, I just thought of, which doesn't quite, well, it sort of goes with this, but I think is an important, it's, it's kind of my public service announcement to everyone out there. Um, so as I was going through menopause, of course, hot flashes, uh, my doctor, who wasn't a regular doctor, of course, this when I was nomadic, I just went to go see someone, they put me back on birth control because, of course, it helps regulate some of the hot flashes as well as some of all the mood stuff that goes on, the emotions. Um, and then two years later, I was on a trip to India, and long story short, I ended up getting blood clots on that flight, on my flight over to India. I didn't know that. I actually spent two weeks there traveling around, didn't understand why I had this slight, why my leg hurt and why I had a slight pain in my lungs. I came back. Um, I kept getting sicker. The pain was worse, whatever. Anyway, ended up with two pulmonary emboli in my lungs. Um, and... The reason, I, it actually, having a doctor and insurance and a home saved my life because it's a long story, but a doctor on the phone basically said, you need to go to urgent care right now and have this checked out. And I'm like, no. But they convinced me, and that's what happened. Anyway, I bring it up because um, we're much more, women are much more susceptible to blood clots uh, when you're on birth control. So they took me off of that and super fast, <laughs> put me on blood thinners, and obviously everything is okay. But I dodged a bullet there, and that was, you know, travel and menopause and not having the right doctors probably and all that stuff. So just a little something to watch out for. 
I, um, I'm a late bloomer, I think, because I have not had the joy of all this yet. But, um, but what I, what the health issue I have is migraines. And, um, and that is something I've had since I was 14. And, and I suspect it's going to get worse as I get older again. Uh, but I can't take any medication other than uh, I take some pretty serious stuff if I get a migraine that wipes it out in 20 minutes. But... But yeah, otherwise, uh, so far so good. good. Hopefully it just like ignores me. And, <laughs> and I hope so too. I hope so, I'm really hoping. <laughs> Don't knock on this door. Because everyone says I have to get ready and I'm like, okay, ready. <laughs> Well, it's actually really good for you to bring this up because of the fact that we as women don't really talk about this, and yet it affects every single one of us. It's the craziest thing ever. I don't know why we don't. But I think one of the things that I have noticed is that growing up, I was taught to be a service provider, to take care of everyone, and I really like making a difference in people's lives, so I didn't really question it. But what happens is if you're always taking care of everyone else, you sometimes forget to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for us always to say, um, check in with ourselves and say, how are you doing? And remind ourselves, you've got this. And also say, what do you need to be doing to take care of yourself the way that you would take care of someone else? That um, the speaker who spoke earlier and showed the picture of the little girl, if you were in here herself when she was a little girl, I think it's really a great thing for everybody to find a picture of yourself when you were little and keep that somewhere and go back to it periodically and say, how are you doing? If I was gonna take care of you, you have so much love and compassion for yourself when you're little. You see that little girl and you're like, oh my gosh, she was so cute and funny and had so many dreams. And if we can say, what can I do to take care of her, then you'll take care of yourself better. I think that's so powerful and important and hard to do sometimes. <laughs> really hard. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I've done some parts work in therapy and <laughs> It's so hard, it's so juicy, you just like sob your way through it, you know, because you're like, what happened? <laughs> um, what are you most excited about in your upcoming travels? I, I have something. <laughs> <laughs> um, yet another chapter of my traveling life and blog, I guess, um, is I've actually started to do some of my, running some of my own trips, reader trips. Um, which I've started to dabble in. For a long time, I'm like, I don't want to take care of anyone on a tour. Like, I, I can't do that. But as I spent all those years traveling solo, one of my, you know, as I said, things always change, right? You got to listen. And I found myself much more enjoying to have people with me as I got older on certain trips. And so I actually started running an Ireland hiking trip uh, for readers, and that went really well, and I loved it. And so I'm like, I'm going to do more. And uh, so now I run a women's um, women's only surfing and hiking or surfing and yoga trip in El Salvador to start off the year, which is an awesome way to start off the year. You learn something new, you stay young, you're reminded about the fact that it's learning something new is very hard, <laughs> but it's always easier to learn something new with women. I do, I'm a big believer in that. Surrounded by women, there's no competition. It's just, it's different. Um, and I'm actually heading off to Alaska next week, uh, taking readers on a tour. So I'm starting to do a few, like maybe one a quarter or so, uh, which is a nice little way for me to mix things up in my travel. And then other than that, I'm back off doing my own little solo things. Um, well, there's two things I'm excited about. One is um, I just spent uh, three months in Mexico. I just got back a few weeks ago. And oh. Is it working now? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Out of practice. <laughs> um, I just spent three months in Mexico and um, because I want to practice slower travel and uh, really get into a place. So I took Spanish lessons every day and lived in uh, the same city for a few months. And... Um, and came back to Toronto to get my booster and see my daughter and then come here and then I'm going back. So, but I don't even actually know where I'm going. So my strategy at the moment is to buy one-way tickets to wherever and, and which is what I did in Mexico. I bought a one-way ticket to Mexico City. I had a place booked the first two weeks and then I had nothing booked after that. And I kind of asked around and looked around, where should I go next? And so I want to try that for a little while and just see like where the world takes me and not really have a plan because 
you know, back in the day when I only had limited time to travel, I would plan for months. And I mean, I was such a plan, uh, yeah. itineraries, the whole, you know, everywhere I'm going to stay, all this stuff. And now I just want to, I just want to go and see what unfolds instead of like planning every step, which is, which is kind of antithetical to how we plan travel anyways. But, um, but I, yeah, I just want to go with it and, and let the universe guide me to where I want to go. And so I don't actually know where I'm going next other than I'm going to buy a plane ticket somewhere and uh, see where that takes me. Um, but the other thing is, it's on your point of wellness, is I'm actually co-hosting um, a wellness retreat in October with one of our uh, tour operators um, in California. And that is going to be like, because I recognize women ha have not taken time for themselves. We have not. We just have not. We've been looking after everyone else uh, for the last two years, if not longer. And, you know, you reach a time in your life when you're like, okay, that's, I really need to, like, look after myself for all the reasons we're talking about here. And uh, so I'm going to try that. And we've got some incredible uh, women coming in to be in this retreat format for uh, five days together and and see if that becomes a thing. I don't know. So I'm excited about what I know and what I don't. <laughs> I have one thing to add on that that you made me think of about the not planning. Because I'm a, I was a type A person, still kind of am, and I wanted to plan everything. And when I took off on that year of career break travel, I wanted to plan everything. Like, the whole year, I'm like, how am I going to figure out a place to stay every night of the year? <laughs> anyway, my, my best advice to anyone who kind of wants to get out there and stop planning and let things happen, because that's not an easy transition to make, is no matter what trip you take, agree to just plan the first third of that trip, whether it's a week, a month, a year. Like, plan it out. It'll make your planning side happy. You'll feel more secure. Your family and friends who are like, ooh, should you be doing this? will feel slightly more secure if you tell them, I have a plan. Um, but then, you know, see what it is that you like. And, and don't plan the other, the other parts of the trip and see where it takes you. I always used to say that, like, if I actually stick to my plan during my career break, because I did have it roughly planned, I would be disappointed in myself. Because to me, my whole point of taking the career break and traveling was to push myself in new directions. So, so one third, just plan one third. Okay. That's good because I don't know what I'm doing on my way home. But <laughs> <laughs> so I, I brought my van here, and I've been living out of my van um, while I've been here at this festival, and uh, even washed my hair last night in my van in the sink and. It, Without a mirror, so I hope you look great. I was going to say something. But I want her hair, actually. Um, me too. So I'll eventually make my, make my way home, and then um, I'm going to be meeting my son and godson and some of their friends in New Orleans. And I've never been to Louisiana, and we're going to eat as many beignets as we possibly can when we're there, awesome. and explore and have fun there um, for their spring break. And uh, then I'm going to be taking the van out again to meet some of my best friends in Arizona, southern Arizona. And uh, they like to plan, so we might have a, have a plan. <laughs> but I'll just go along with them, and that will be kind of fun to have two vans going along. And then what I'm really excited about is I'm going to be taking the Damesley trip to Jordan and leading that. So I think there's some spaces left on it. And if anybody hey. wants to join me there, yeah. it would be really fun. Yeah, she's going to be leading the Damesley tour to Jordan. And when I said, hey, have you ever been to Jordan? She's like, yeah, but the last time I was with Val Kilmer. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's going to be a different experience. <laughs> that, that was a crazy story. I was hired to write a documentary about filmmaking because I'm a writer I met Val in a parking lot, and he said, hey, I'm doing this film in Jordan. And so I went out there to do that, and I didn't get to see anything when I was it there, happens, right? except yeah. I was in Petra for like 15 minutes, and, and then I was on the Dead Sea for like 10 minutes, and I want to go back and see it. So I'm so excited about this. So thank Yay. you. I'm so excited, it's too. It's a wonderful and country. Listen, like, the travel industry is ageist AF and has been for a really long time, like... I think the whole reason I started Damesley was because I was like, okay, I'm looking at the travel industry and you're either doing a Contiki party bus or you're doing Rick Steves. Like, and there's nowhere in between. Yep. And so why I think this, this topic is important is because it's really great to hear like, no, you don't have to do that. Like, you don't, you know, you don't have to choose 
one thing or another. You can stay in a hostel at 85 or you can, you know, mm -hmm. you can just choose what feels best for you. And I think, like, we always just have such societal pressure on, like, you should travel this way. And, and I get emails constantly, always from older women who are like, am I going to be comfortable? Never from younger women. Oh. And so it's like, I think you, as you age, you kind of, some things you care less about and some things you care more about. So yeah, I can say, Kelly, most of my readers are 50 and, and up. Uh, Evelyn was 78 when she passed away, so we have a, a huge number of women that are over 65, and they feel ignored by the travel industry. They feel like, um, you know, you go, I know as a publisher, going to, uh, trying to find images of older women solo doing something adventurous. If you have any, I would love them because <laughs> it's almost impossible. Like, I spend hours looking for the right photos and trying to get photos and... Um, there, it's always a woman with a man on a beach, and it's like, that is not what women are doing. Women are out there, they're kicking it, they are climbing mountains, they are hiking, they are doing all kinds of adventurous stuff, and to show an older woman sitting on a beach with her, with some man, like, no. <laughs> no! We ain't so, doing it. <laughs> yeah, so I, I feel like this incredible responsibility to, um, to advocate for older women, and, and I don't even mean older, and by the way, we didn't even know, I didn't even know what my age was when you guys asked me five minutes ago, I was like, I don't know. But, but this whole thing of women in travel and then older women in travel is, is the problem. Do, do, you know, do you know the um, Japanese definition of age? This is so cool. I don't, our, our country's really messed up because really. we need to follow theirs. They really celebrate three birthdays that they think are milestones. One is when you become an adult, that's 21. One, when you become old, not elderly, but old, 86. <laughs> so you're not even old until you're 86. And then the third one is when you're 100. Okay, now you're elderly. So we've got some work to do, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> I think that's an excellent place to end this conversation. <laughs> Thank you, ladies, so much for your time. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm sure these ladies will stick around. Um, oh, you know what? Come on up. I think we have time for like one or two. No, I just want to tell you that I'll send you a picture of me jumping into the Colorado River um, when I wrapped it in May, and I am 70. Yes. Yeehaw. I'm just going to... For our virtual audience, she's going to send a picture of her jumping into the Colorado River when she rafted, and she is 70. So, absolutely, yes. I want it. Believe me. <laughs> awesome. We, uh, we profile women over, over 85 that are doing amazing things. So, come on up. Hi, everyone. Um, I am. Here, come come to the microphone so the our virtual friends can hear us. Hi, virtual friends. <laughs> Hi, ladies. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. I am Kim, and I do have a brand called The Abundant Traveler. I am the only YouTuber over 50 with wrinkles. So what I am looking for is more organizations like Journey Woman, more organizations where I can connect to women that are active and 50 yeah. plus, because what I'm coming across is I'm drawn to the 35-year-olds who are adults, but I'm drawn to that because they're active, whereas I'm only coming across some of the organizations for women my age that they just want to sit on the beach and read a book. And I still want to jump into the Colorado River <laughs> and off of things and through things and all of that. So any suggestions for websites, groups, organizations, all of that? So I actually stupidly bought another business last summer um, <laughs> in the pandemic, which, which was offered to me by a woman in New Zealand who had a women-friendly travel resource website directory that offers women-friendly tours, guides, retreats, and accommodations. And, um, and we did have a bit of that on the site under, as you know, maybe 25 uh, women tours. Now I have uh, 850 women's uh, tours, retreats. I'm giving guides free listings because I want women to find women guides. And uh, I've just done a partnership with a group called Femme B&B out of Toronto that has women-friendly accommodations. So it's an alternative to Airbnbs. So I'm looking for, you know, women, 
women who want to market to my readers, and I have 60,000 people on my mailing list, it's one of the larger mailing lists um, in women's travel, that I want to be intentional where they spend their dollar. I want them to support other women businesses. I just wrote an article about it, you can read on the site. Hire women, support women, buy from women. All this stuff that we all want to do together is what I'm trying to do through, through Journey Woman. So I welcome any ideas or suggestions or anything. Oh, that's, this is truly what I want to do for the rest of my life is to help other women. Awesome. Thank you so much, ladies. Um, I actually just, your question is awesome. And we had a really fun conversation yesterday about this whole topic. And you just have answered a question that I've had. So I think that when women who are our age are out traveling, because we didn't grow up with social media, we didn't grow up with computers. I mean, I can remember <laughs> when I first started teaching, I was using ditto machines, you know, and, and I didn't have an answering machine on my phone. And <laughs> yeah, oh, typewriters too. So uh, we come from a completely different, not just generation, but a completely different world than, than what the people who are, women who are 30, 40 growing up in. Um, and so one of the questions I've had is that it feels really odd to me to think about posting my life on the internet and sharing my travels with an audience because I've always done it by myself. And yet, so I've been really struggling with that here because so many people do that and they're comfortable with it and I just, it feels really odd because I am private. And yet, when I was looking for van lifers and I fell down that rabbit hole and was stuck for like three hours on watching YouTube videos, I didn't see anybody who looked like me. I saw all these young kids who were out there doing this, or couples. There was one woman who was older, didn't look anything like me, and had a very different experience that she was having in the van. So maybe I do need to post what I'm doing so that yes. I can show other women, you can go and do this. And so you just answered that question for me. So I appreciate it. You, yeah. yes, you absolutely do. And I just want to tell you a quick story that I learned recently while I was writing Tell Her She Can't. So as I was writing this book, I met a woman named Sandra Hart, who was an actress um, for many years and then retired, decided she wanted to act later in life. And then, you know, at 79, decided to launch a YouTube channel. And now at 83, she has 6 million subscribers. So that's the thing is like, yes, you do need to do that. And I've talked to a lot of women here who are like, I'm ready to make a career change. I just don't know what to do. Like, don't count yourself out. Do what feels right to you. Talk about where you are right now because there's so many people. There's such a lack of space in the 65 and older community when it comes to travel, Absolutely. right? So we're still redefining and we need people to like push the, the envelope on what that looks like, what that really looks like, not just what we've been told it looks like. Yeah, and by the way, I mean, women over 50 have more time, more money, more experience, yeah. I think more courage, more, like, we are, we are there, we're ready to go, right? Are we not? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go. All right, we really do have to go, but thank you. Thank you so much for your time, ladies. Thank you, we'll be right back.